In the beginning of March, news broke that NVIDIA, one of the world's largest and most well-known computer hardware companies, had been breached. NVIDIA has been hacked. Trey Brian, we talked to him about Lapsus, which has broken into not just NVIDIA. NVIDIA hacked. DLSS source code leaked. Maybe switch to question mark? Yeah, this is pretty rough. At the time, it wasn't exactly clear what data had been stolen. However, it was clear that at the very least, customer data was safe. As news broke, a small and at the time not well-known threat group claimed responsibility. In their claim, they had said that they had captured over one terabyte of NVIDIA's proprietary code and they were threatening to release chunks of it if NVIDIA did not pay an extortion payment. They also made a number of other threats, including threats to NVIDIA if they did not lift a cap that they had placed on NVIDIA hardware that throttled the amount of cryptocurrencies that could be mined using its hardware. These demands were ignored by NVIDIA and eventually lapses started to incrementally leak out data that they had stolen from NVIDIA. This data included everything from the proprietary software of that hardware that allows developers to lift that artificial cap on crypto mining, but it also included other things like signed certificates that would allow malware developers to create malware that would be signed by NVIDIA and could bypass detection. All of this news, however, was buried as headlines continue to mainly cover the Russian invasion of Ukraine and concerns continue to mount on whether or not Russia is planning a cyber attack on the West. However, that breach was very quickly followed up with claims by the very same small unknown threat group on Samsung, Bing, Okta, and later Globant, as well as claims that they had breached Vodafone, Mercado Libre, LG, and Ubisoft. Each of these breaches involved massive leaks of data, which included primarily proprietary code and security data. By far, the most concerning breach that this group managed to pull off in this entire string of cyber attacks was their breach of Okta, by way of Okta's third-party security provider, Siddle. To contextualize why this breach was so bad, Okta is a company that specializes in identity and access management. They work with numerous clients for this small, unknown group to have hacked so many large companies, including a security company, that sure raised some eyebrows. All of these hacks and the group behind these hacks, the small unknown threat group behind these attacks that has quickly risen to notoriety is called Lapsus. From what we know right now, Lapsus appears to be a relatively small threat group that primarily focuses on extortion campaigns. They'll attack companies, attempt to steal data, and then threaten them for extortion payments and leak the data if payments are not made. While they were primarily believed to be based in South America, it is known that there are some members, at least in the UK, that were at least former members, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Their breach of Okta went as far back as January, and as Okta puts it, it included a third-party security engineer. In their statement, which might I add was released months after the event in March, Okta stated that they had not suspected any other hostile activities on their network, and they believe the incident to have been contained. However, just before Okta released that statement, Lapsus published a number of screenshots on their Telegram channel, which appeared to have have shown them inside an Okta management console. That indicated that perhaps their access into Okta was a little bit deeper than we had originally thought. Shortly after the breach of Okta and everything that followed, news broke that seven teens in the UK had been arrested by UK police, which included as some asserted is the ringleader of Lapsus. The relief that all of this was coming to an end, however, was short-lived, as Lapsus would then again post in their Telegram channel screenshots showing that they had hacked Globant, an IT and software solutions company. This is yet another concerning cyber attack, as Globant is a major provider for a number of other large companies, which include American Express, Coca-Cola, Dell, among others. The staggering speed, pace, and scope scope that Lapsus has managed to pull these attacks off have left a number of questions. And they have also taught us a number of things about the cybersecurity industry as a whole. And it's important that we look at all this objectively and consider where we are as an industry and what we can learn from this. Some of the questions are, how does Lapsus manage to pull off these attacks? What are the goals that Lapsus has set? And then finally, how is it that so many multi-billion dollar companies 
failed to stop them. The Microsoft security team released an article which detailed a number of TTPs that Lapsus uses. In it, they detail how Lapsus primarily uses social engineering as a method of gaining access, whether through paying for users for multi-factor authentication information, which will ultimately allow for successful logins, or by calling the target's help desk to reset user passwords. They also noted how Lapsus will scan public code repositories for credentials or purchase stolen credentials on underground hacker forums. A significant vector that Lapsus has leveraged to gain initial access to their targets appears to be insider threats. That's where an employee that may be either frustrated with their position or just desperate for money or any number of other reasons may actually provide a threat group with information that they shouldn't. In this case, employees would be paid to provide either access to VPNs or session tokens or their own user credentials. Microsoft coverage of this vector reflects a message that Lapsus posted on their Telegram basically calling for exactly that. In their message, they clarify that they are not looking for employees to provide the data itself. They are merely interested in gaining a foothold. In that message, they also list a number of targets that they would like to attack, which include a number of telecom and tech companies, including Apple, Microsoft, AT&T, IBM, among others. Once Lapsus gains a foothold, they then proceed to use publicly available tools from the internet, actually, to be able to expand visibility into the target's network and escalate privileges. As Microsoft points out, they are able to exploit known vulnerabilities that are unpatched in the internal network that allows them to escalate privileges either in Jira, GitLab, or Confluence. They'll also search internal code repositories for exposed credentials and other sensitive information. After escalating their privileges, they then proceed to create a new admin account where they then delete the other admin accounts that the actual security team and engineering staff use, thereby locking them out. And then they proceed to exfiltrate data and then just destroy everything in their way. Destroying the data, spinning the machines down, and then they basically leave the environment after that. And that is whenever their extortion negotiations begin. Of note, those public tools that they're using from GitHub are allowing them to bypass some security tooling, including FireEye. At least in the case of the Octobreach, that appears to have been what happened. So what exactly are Lapsus' goals? Lapsus' Lapsus I? Lapsus. Lapsus. While their actions have been derided by some cybersecurity professionals as crude and unprofessional, the fact of the matter is they still manage to hack all these massive companies. Their use of public tools and often inconsistent and definitely unprofessional messaging definitely indicate that they are not the second coming of Conti. That said, that hasn't stopped them from pulling off some of the largest cyber attacks that we've certainly seen in recent memory, and the fact that they did it within about a month is incredible. Well, they did it in a few months, but they certainly announced them all pretty quickly. As far as motives go, they claim to be non-political. Again, they're from South America. They're not tied to the war in Ukraine. So if you see anything that's basically saying that Laps is, is tied to that or has any kind of political motivations like that, that simply doesn't appear to be the case. However, that non-affiliation and that non-relation to the war in Ukraine and a potential Russian cyber attack might actually be one of the main reasons why they have absolutely sunk in the headlines and not gotten the news coverage that perhaps they would have were there not a war in Ukraine. It is unclear what impact the arrests in the UK will have on the group. Again, if it is true that one of those teenagers was the real ringleader of Lapsus, then perhaps we'll see some sort of splintering or some sort of slowdown in their operations. However, again, we just aren't, we don't know yet. Only time can really tell on that. As of the time of this writing, only the Globin hack has been announced since uh, those teenagers were arrested. And for all we know, that could have been an attempt to regain the media initiative and not so much them continuing on unabated. So what exactly do all of these hacks and the way that those hacks were conducted as well as the way that the investigations and the fallout have illuminated the way that companies handle these kinds of investigations and breaches. You know, what can we learn about the cybersecurity industry as a whole right now in 2022? Simply put, these massive international organizations were breached by what seems to be a group of kids. A group of kids, no less, that do not operate like an organized threat group. They use public tooling and they indicate infighting and a lack of unity in their 
public telegram channel. That said, none of that matters. N none of the professionalism or advanced tooling matter. While the GRU, Conti, and other more advanced threat groups out in the world certainly do use more advanced tooling to gain access to these large organizations, Lapsus use social engineering techniques and publicly available tools from GitHub to be able to gain access to targets, exploit known vulnerabilities that again were not patched, and then exfiltrate data. These are basic things that we harp on all the time, at least on this channel, certainly in other cybersecurity circles, that patching is important to do, social engineering is a problem, and all of that can completely negate the expensive tooling and monitoring that you have in place. By no means is the money that is spent on advanced tooling and monitoring a waste of money. That certainly is important to have. Don't throw all of that away. However, it, it kind of is a waste if all the employees in the company are not completely aware of the cyber threat and what is expected of them. As was the case with Okta and Siddle, it just took one insider threat to cause huge damage to the reputations of both companies and to the security of both companies. It doesn't matter how many layers of security you have in your architecture, if you leave internal systems unpatched, attackers will find those and exploit those vulnerabilities. All of that is a huge challenge, especially for organizations of this size. The larger these organizations get, the more hardware is out there, the more difficult it is to maintain complete visibility the more difficult it is to implement patching without any kind of unnecessary downtime, the more difficult it is to train employees up. This increases costs, this increases work, this increases everything. As Dave Kennedy said in his interview on the Cyber Monday show, it's much easier to secure a smaller size company because the attack surface is substantially lower. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's substantially easier because you can get away with a lot more things like you know, for example, application control or application whitelisting, try doing it to an enterprise of 50,000 versus 100 employees. Very different, right? So, you know, securing a small size organization and being on the, the red team side for years, I'll tell you, some of the smallest companies are the hardest for me to break into. It had to be the most creative and figure out. I mean, everybody knows each other. You know, you, you impersonate somebody in the employer, like you're not that person, you know? So, you know, it, big companies have big attack surfaces. That said, it's incredibly important for larger organizations to at least to try to come up with some sort of a solution to this problem. But the, all of that only covers the technical side of security. We haven't even talked about the human side of security, and I think that is where the real lesson is to be learned with lapses. None of the work done on the technical side of security matters if the human side of security is not accounted for. Again, lapses recognized a weakness on the human side of security with these multi-billion dollar organizations organizations. They recognize that chances are they could find at least one insider threat within each organization. And they weren't asking those insiders to send them proprietary information or anything like that. They were simply asking for a session token or an MFA prompt or even tricking them into resetting user credentials. We've said before that humans could be the weakest link in security, but they can also be your strongest link in security. And this is certainly one example of what happens whenever humans act as the weak link in security. With adequate training and awareness, users are able to recognize whenever they are acting as an insider threat by accident, whether they are being tricked into resetting a user account or tricked into sharing sensitive information like an MFA code or a session token with an outsider. That said, that doesn't exactly cover whenever employees are intended intentionally acting as insider threats. And that's where you layer security monitoring and making sure that if one employee decides to turn and help adversaries, then at least you can catch it pretty quickly. And unfortunately, it doesn't appear that they were caught quick enough. No doubt this lapses saga has taught us all and whether or not it's over or if it's about to continue on more despite the arrests, you know, time will only tell. But looming over all of this and certainly in the back of my mind is, the, is again the growing threat of a Russian cyber attack. If we can't stop a bunch of kids, then how is it that we're going to stop an entire intelligence agency? And maybe I'm comparing two completely different things because everybody's attention are, is probably already on like say the GRU and not necessarily on Lapsus and so that's another reason why Lapsus succeeded. That could be valid. But in either case it certainly doesn't make one comfortable knowing what a small, quote, unsophisticated or unprofessional group like Lapsus managed to do whenever you have sophisticated and, and advanced and professional groups like the GRU and Conti out there. With all that, we're certainly probably going to find out. But if this video was helpful or informative, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. You know, I had a lot of fun making this, but I definitely, you know, want to know if you're interested in more videos like this and hey, liking that video and leaving a nice comment saying, where 
is your mustache? I miss it. I miss it too. It certainly lets me know that this is all something that I should keep working on. And until next time, I'll see you next time. Bye.